Hi, I'm Elizabeth Baer. And I'm Scott Lynch. And we are here to do an entirely unscripted review, very, very tipsy review. Review in air quotes. You can't, <laughs> you can't see the air quotes, but take the air quotes as read because you are trapped here with us and glasses of bourbon and ace. Or orc trot. Orc the draft. Orc, orc draft. draft. Yes, it's not bourbon. It's orc draft because this is Tolkien. Damn it. Um, <laughs> and Ace, the Wonder Dog, who is a ninety-pound briard who may occasionally chew on squeaky toys. Um, we will try to keep him calm. And we are we are here to talk about the Hobbit: The Desolation of Subplots. Oh uh, yeah, the Hobbit Part Thirty Six: The Reawakening. <laughs> The second half, Leaf, the Leaf return, by Niggle, part 72. The unexpurgated pain that was um, our, our trip to the cinema. Hey, I need we, bourbon. We watched The Hobbit, so you didn't have 35 to. 35 seconds in and I need bourbon. Uh, I, I don't know. Do we have anything good to say about it? It ended. It ended. I, I, did, I did like Toriel. Not, I actu- not actually an infinite movie. No. The, the thing that everybody complained about, which was the random outsourced elf... Uh, because apparently dwarves are so incompetent that even in their own movie they have to be rescued by elves, even if we have to outsource elves from other other places in the Tolkien canon. Yes. Um, but but I actually I kind of liked her. Uh, Legolas looked awfully constipated, but Toriel was pretty good. Yeah, Legolas <laughs> looked like he was trying to poop a Silmaril. <laughs> <laughs> which you sure is, that wasn't an which is unfortunate. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, those familiar with with uh, you know me physically should know that I am something of an elf partisan. Um, and I am, I, am a, I am a hearty dwarf partisan. <laughs> so we, we, we've got a, uh, you know, a, a mixed Middle Earth race relationship going on here. My, Nonetheless, I, I... My I, inability to grow a beard is a great, great sorrow to me. It is not a sorrow to me. <laughs> um, I, I feel like we should be more constructive and I feel like we should lay some of our, our biases and expectations on the table. But so hey, for, we have bourbon. Yes, we do. We do have bourbon. <laughs> and if there's one thing that helps arguments and cohesiveness, it's bourbon. Um, so just to, to, to talk about where we're coming from. Um, I mean, I myself, I loved the Lord of the Rings movies for the most part. I saw The Fellowship of the Ring in theaters six times. I could have seen it more. I saw The Two Towers five times. I saw Return of the King once, and that was sufficient for me, although I've seen it a couple times on DVD. And Return of the King is where the creeping Peter Jacksonification of the whole thing sort of really... I mean, it really, it's where things sort of... It, it breaks from minor, um, you know, elements to seriously detracting and distracting aspects of the production. He got confident, and that was the beginning of the end. Yeah, and it's it's. Uh, I, I was I was leery of the first Hobbit movie. I mean, for, I was I was leery about the whole project because you know the the project was conceived as two films. And by God, you could make a pretty damn good Hobbit movie um, in two parts. You know, you consider six hours to tell the story of the Hobbit. If you can't do it, you fail at everything. Well, I, 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 you could even divide it up into into a trilogy. If you, this would have made actually a pretty decent ninety-seven minute movie. Yes, if, if you wanted to make three ninety-seven minute Hobbit movies, I, I wouldn't stop you. I wouldn't hold your hand, but I wouldn't stop you. <laughs> yes, but I'm, I'm were... about to fly to New Zealand. But and... you would. Yes, <laughs> it's you would, too you late. Would... It's too late. They finished shooting. You would have to be making the Hobbit movie, and I, I think the, the the telling point is that these were originally conceived as two films, and then they were extended to three after most of the principal photography. By extended, had... Scott means stretched on the rack. Uh, yes, placed on a rack and stretched <laughs> while screaming. Um, after most of of what was then principal photography had been completed, um, so they were they were turned into a trilogy through the uh, judicious application of filler. Um, it, it, essentially, it, it, you know, it, you know, it's not like I won't give my money to the producers of films that I enjoy because I did just say that I've spent several days watching previous uh, Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not think trying of, to pretend that I think I'm, of how many gentleman bastard books he could have written in the time when he was watching and rewatching none Lord of the because Rings I films. wasn't writing gentleman <laughs> bastards books. Um, oh, is that a bus, Scott? Yes. <laughs> If you hear a bus in the distance, ladies and gentlemen, that's the one my girlfriend always has on call to throw me under. I love you too, <laughs> darling. Hey, look, bourbon. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not totally aghast at the whole notion of cinematic Tolkien. I really, really enjoyed much about the Lord of the Rings film trilogy. And I was, I was leery. The, the, the whole, the, Peter Jackson's unfortunate elf 
issue is getting more and more uncomfortable to be in the same room with. Uh, um, yeah, it, and it, I, is, it is reaching that point where it's like you have a friend that you know has a weird-ass fetish, but it's like he never wore the clown suit to a dinner party before. And Peter Jackson is wearing the clown suit everywhere these days. Everywhere. Uh, the elf ears. I, yeah. This, okay. it's, it's okay to have a fetish. It's not okay to make all your friends live with it 24-7. <laughs> and, and that is essentially... <laughs> That is essentially the Hobbit two, the overpopulation of elves, in a, in a nutshell. Um, you know, I, I I cannot deny that the architecture of the Hobbit in my head, the actual story itself, you know, the one written by that Tolkien guy, um, is so strong that that I am feeling some cognitive dissonance just from what was done um, to it in this movie. And and here's the thing, I, I I'm not against divergence. I'm not against additions. Oh, there will be spoilers. There, there yes, there there will be spoilers all over the place. We watched this movie, so you don't have to. Or if you do, you were warned. Have bourbon. Have bourbon. Bourbon, the drink of kings. The the outside food of choice for the <laughs> Hobbit is bourbon. <laughs> A magic potion that makes things easier. Um, <laughs> It's it's just the, <laughs> including dealing with other people's self fetishes. The, the first Hobbit movie started to diverge pretty substantially, but it diverged mostly in the sense that it was adding bits and pieces from other Tolkienic lore that really had nothing to do with the Hobbit. This movie diverges in the sense that Jackson has now put the plot of the Hobbit itself into a Cuisinart and sprayed it all over the wall. The the. I, I, am, I was actually okay. I believe that... Okay, I believe that adaptations are, are adaptations. They are not meant to be faithful, word-for-word -word reconstructions unless that's how the narrative is, is chosen to be developed. But And that film and literature have different demands as media. That said, when your idea of injecting more dramatic tension to the narrative is to turn to turn 95% uh, of the characters in the narrative into douchebags. And by this I mean Bard is a douchebag. Mm -hmm. Thranduil is a douchebag. Thr well, he's supposed to be a douchebag. Legolas, who was not even supposed to be in this movie, is a douchebag. Um, Thorin is a douchebag. Oh, hell yeah. Smaug is a douchebag. The, the most... Her I mean... I have been waiting now for approximately six and a half years to get to the scene where Smaug finally shows up. And I was really excited, and it was visually very cool, and there was this whole wonderful dragon asleep under a pile of gold, waking up slowly, twitching, Hobbit realizing how fucked he is process that was really good. And then there was 40 minutes of incredible boredom that followed in which Smaug was a pretentious douchebag. It was like Reddit Smaug, <laughs> which is unfair to Reddit because, you know, like fantasy Reddit is pretty cool. But, um, and part of the problem, part of the reason that happened is that all of the cool things that are supposed to happen in the scene where, where Bilbo confronts Smaug and, and is a trickster and gets him to reveal his weakness and discovers the Arkenstone and so on and so forth. Well, all of that narrative actually happens earlier in the movie, like back in Lake Town. So this scene is doing absolutely nothing except having a dragon chase a hobbit around a pile of gold. And exposit. Very slowly. Pompously. Very slowly. It's, it's the mild cardio version of the hobbit chase workout. <laughs> And the other thing we, we, we learned from this movie is that uh, dragons are caused by bad thoughts. Dragons are not actually just like a, a force of nature or a thing that happens or, you know, you happen to have a, a rich and wealthy civilization. No, dragons show up because you're greedy and wicked and maybe a little mad and they are God's punishment. So they're it, like, it's like the new age, dragons are the new age cancer of Middle Earth. Yeah, I. You reach a point where where you really have ceased. I, I, and you know, as I've said, I'm all in favor of embellishing and reinventing and reinvigorating. You know, I appreciated much of what was done to the Lord of the Rings books, um, but you reach a point where you, you kind of cease looking at an adaptation, and you, you're really looking at something that is 
you know, quote unquote, based upon. And this is less an adaptation of The Hobbit, and, and we've really, really gone into very deep based upon waters. Um, if you look at a lot of the changes um, in the Lord of the Rings films, a lot of them were just incidental. Um, one of the ones that, uh, that had um, certain flavors of purists really up in arms in The Fellowship of the Ring was the fact that Arwen uh, greets the Fellowship um, at the river as they are fleeing from the Nazgul. And that sort of, you know, Brett, whereas it's, it's not her in the books, you know, oh no, we have, we have transgressed upon the purity of, of, of the original text. The change is, is meaningless. What is important is that there is an elf there who receives the fellowship and asserts the powers of Elrond's domain against the Nazgul. It doesn't matter who it is. I would, I, I would actually disagree. I would, I would say that the, the change adds structural strength to the narrative because it introduces a character and makes us like them. It will be you're, useful later. You're veering away on a tangent here from what I'm trying to oh, talk about. Oh, sorry. Because um, I'm not talking about Fellowship of the Ring. Um, we got time to burn, baby. Well, that, that's, that's, and, and a, that's true. You are our prisoners and no one is paying seven, us for this, and, except we are paying ourselves in liquor. Seven-eighths of a bottle of bourbon left to go. <laughs> <laughs> that much left? Wow, all right. Um, okay. It's a now, big bottle. It, it, it does not matter for the, the greater shape of the story. Um, which elf meets the fellowship? It, you know, it, it could be Elrond, it could be Arwen, it could be Squimby the Piss Boy. Um, as long as there's an elf there to make the river do its thing and the fellowship gets away and Frodo receives his elvish healing, yada, yada, yada. Um, these are not the, so the sorts of substitutions that are taking place in The Hobbit Part 2. Um, these were the sorts of substitutions that were starting to take place in The Hobbit Part 1, but in Part 2, he has really done this sort of, um, uh, you know, a thoracic surgery. It's a complete <laughs> rerouting and bypass of so many of the narrative threads. Much like the biology of those Merkwood spiders, <laughs> which, were, which were very... I actually really like the Merkwood spiders, but somebody needs to talk to... Weta yes. about spider... Spider anatomy, not what a workshop strong point. <laughs> um, but hey, they've got big smiles. Um, no, you know, Mirkwood was one, of the, was one of the few parts of this movie that I thought pretty unequivocally worked. It was, it was eerie, it was beautiful, it didn't go on too long. It did what it was meant to do. You had a very cool illusion slash hallucination scene. It was creepy, it was effective. Um, you know, it, it wasn't nine and a half hours long, like the next 10% of the movie. I think we were actually in the theater from December 24th until December 29th. Roughly speaking. Um, roughly yes. speaking. I don't, yes. Um, you know, like, like we, we came out and new countries had been born, revolutions had occurred, um, you know, my beard was down to my knees. It Scott, was pretty amazing. Scott actually was falling asleep on my shoulder yeah, that, during that, the dragon chase. That is not... Um, and I, I kept him awake by flailing. Yeah, that, that, that is not <laughs> hyperbole. I was, it was the middle of the afternoon, and I was literally falling asleep. I was nodding off. I felt my legs doing that kicking thing as you're starting to, you know, pass into the, the, the sea of unconsciousness. And this is a fucking Tolkien movie that's doing this to me. You know, I, I just said I sat through The Fellowship of the Ring six times. It's not Bill long movies. And I'm not that old, damn it! Um, nor was Bill I drunk. Beggins. Nor was I tired. <laughs> I was falling asleep during the Smaug scenes. For the love of God, your dragon scenes were boring. That is the cardinal sin of all of these things, is that they result in a convolutedly boring movie. None of the narrative changes, none of the new story directions, none of the Weird ass surgery that was performed. Bard um, paddling away in his douche. Uh, yeah, on, on this narrative, <laughs> amounts to anything. None of it adds depth. None of it adds wonder. None of it adds to the sense of concrete reality of Middle Earth. It, it may, in fact, detract from it, wonder. It, it, because, it, it I mean, they, they, they spent so much goddamn money on this dragon. I, just, I, I, I could probably live comfortably for the rest of my life. On and very comfortably on the amount of money that was spent on this dragon. The, the the art direction is beautiful. The way he moves is beautiful. The design is gorgeous. He looks fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then they spent forty minutes chasing him around with a steady cane. Sort cane, of stumbling around, having some chat. Which is the greatest way to rob any cool thing Much of a chat. sense of wonder. So dragon. I am fire. 
I am death. Yes, and I it, am a douchebag. Th- th- there was this this weird um, also audio progression where you know, smog <laughs> begins. He's got this heavily processed voice at the very beginning. It's very deep, and uh, he steadily loses the processing. And loses it and loses it and loses it until by the very end. It's basically just Benedict Cumberbatch talking into a microphone. And it's it's not really... Which is and, fine, but doesn't which, sound which much is, like Which a is dragon. fine, you know? We, I love Benedict Cumberbatch's voice. I would listen to him read the phone book. Um, wait, I wouldn't. Um, but close. I know a lot of people who would, though. Many of them on Tumblr. Oh, yes, all um, of them are on Tumblr. Yeah. <laughs> all of Tumblr. Um, Hello, Tumblr. We love you. We do love you, Tumblr. Um, but you love Benedict Cumberbatch's voice a little more than we do. Um, but it was, you know, it was just, it was one of those strange... And, and Tumblr is okay with that. It, it, it was just one of those strange aesthetic... Dis- I mean, it's it, a, a lot like the uh, the, the, the strange um, Photoshop uh, relief effects on Galadriel when she uh, looks into her mirror in the Fellowship of the Ring and sort of, you know, flares up and gives Frodo that terrible vision of what might happen if Solarized she... Solarized you know, Galadriel. Yes, yes, you know, ten bucks and, and some interns and a I few hours of Photoshop. Yeah, I... I the special effects that I could accomplish myself in high school, really not super impressive. <laughs> ah, you hear the uncorkage. <laughs> the sound of more Knob Creek Kentucky bourbon. Uh, we, we are drinking burnt maple bourbon. Yes, yeah, smoked, smoked maple, smoked Knob, maple Creek, Knob Creek, Kentucky Creek bourbon. Street. Bourbon. The bourbon unofficial Street. sponsor of this non-commercial podcast. Knob Creek is our life support mechanism. And I have resealed it. You need to drink faster. I will I'm eventually. Um, I will eventually. Um, but yeah, so you, you had... It's just one of those weird-ass aesthetic decisions where it, you really wonder what it was in aid of. You know, what did it accomplish? Um, by all means, let Smaug be loud in one scene, quiet in another, but the voice changes um, substantially he as the scenes go on. He loses his reverb. He, yeah, he loses reverb, he loses majesty, and by the time you've been hanging out with this guy for six fucking hours... Um, he's he's a mall ninja. Yeah. Smaug the ma- <laughs> is now the mall ninja of dragons. Because it, <laughs> this elementary filmmaking 101, you present this visual threat. Smaug is a 75-foot-tall dragon. He's glorious. He's huge. It is obvious that he weighs tons. If he so much as flicks a toe at a human-sized character or a hobbit-sized character, they're doomed. So how do you maintain a sense of credible tension and threat when this guy can just step on the adventuring party and everything is over? You don't do what this movie does, which basically has them running around under his feet for 15 fucking minutes. They they create this sense of majestic dragon awe, this sense of, of threat and menace, and then they totally undercut it by having these dwarves essentially play on Smaug's back and under his dragon balls and <laughs> around his dragon feet. Actually, we, we never see Smaug's dragon balls either. No, I, well, I, I, I would suspect that him being a reptile, they're probably internal. Um, I, I would like to talk about some things I actually liked. Well, this is Middle Earth. Everyone reproduces by budding. Art, art Deco uh, uh, dwarves. The dwarves are totally Art Deco, and, true, and I'm totally true. cool with that. I mean, it's bizarre, but I was like, sure, Art Deco. Although, apparently, one of the things that, that Saruman learned from dealing with dwarves is scaffolding. Because dwarves don't, dwarves don't believe in OSHA compliance. Dwarves don't have scaffolding. Dwarves don't have handrails. But yeah, it, Saruman's uh, it workshop made It made perfect does. sense with the Bridge of Khazad Doom because this is a defensive structure. The whole point is anybody who tries to cross this thing in the face of committed dwarven resistance is committing suicide. But when every single... I mean, inside the residences, inside their city, inside their workshops, this place is an OSHA reporting nightmare. <laughs> if you if you want to revolutionize Middle Earth, bring them handrails. That's what all Saruman was trying to do. Y- yeah, I, you that's know, all he was trying to do. He's so maligned. The the orcs rebuilding Barad-dûr for God's sake. They had scaffolding. They had handrails. They weren't fools. But these dwarves. Well, on the other hand, the thing about the Hobbit physics is that these movies have have pretty much shown us that the uh, the fatal. The, the, to, to, to fall and die in Middle Earth, you really have to fall from a height greater than 400 feet. Because some, 300 feet or less, you're just going to kind of bounce around. Some directors cannot survive contact with 3D. Oh, God, yes. Um, but I was talking about things I like. There's one more thing I liked. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought that was going to be the... Uh, you said something, so I thought you were done. The um, uh, 
I, I really liked the uh, dragon fire breathing special effect. I mean, admittedly, it is a action movie explosion and you can outrun it and it can brush by you from three feet away and you are not actually seared to death by the 20,000 degree air. The, you know, the, the vaporized plasma six inches from you won't hurt you at all. Don't worry. But the way Smaug does the glowing, partially cooled lava thing right before he breathes fire is extremely oh, yeah, cool. That's pretty neat. I, I was, well, I mean, it's, it's very similar to the special effect that I used in one of my books. So of course I love it, but it's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Um, I, I would really like to talk about the thermodynamics of Middle Earth for it a while, though, while we're on it. <laughs> because apparently you can, you can float down a river of molten gold in a wheelbarrow, in your douche canoe. Yeah, this is, this is one of the more... <laughs> douche okay, canoe okay, is look. the word for this movie. This, this is a fantasy okay, movie. Everyone has a movie. douche canoe. Chock full of magic and all the yada yada whatever. So our suspension of disbelief is already elastic. As, here, as a kayaker, I would like to protest those barrels. Here, yeah, here's the <laughs> thing. You, you, and I've, I've talked about this so many times when discussing writing. It is no different in a visual medium. Um, you purchase viewer suspension of disbelief by grounding things in reality as often as possible so that when it comes time for you to break or bend the laws of physics the viewers go eh, yeah, I don't really care rather than oh that's such bullshit the scene where Thorin heaves a wheelbarrow into a stream of molten gold kneels upon it and sails it into a tiny stone passageway which really ought to have been as the a, end for the as, king as under the mountain. As a firefighter, how do you feel about that, Scott? As a firefighter, <laughs> let me give you a 25-minute drunken rant about why why we don't use wheelbarrows to surf on molten gold in the fire service. There's fucking reasons. <laughs> Reason number one is physics. And physics is not your friend. When, when you are crouched upon bare knees on a wheelbarrow above a river of molten gold. Physics is not your friend. Physics is, is a mean drunk and it's out to fucking get you. Thorns... Also, does, does molten gold have the viscosity of water? <laughs> no, it does not. Molten gold is slightly denser <laughs> than water. You know, th this this is absolutely ridiculous that I find myself What is the specific this... gravity of a douche canoe? <laughs> <laughs> Lighter than air, apparently. Um... <laughs> The scene in um, Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, where Anakin rolls down near a molten river and bursts into flame from radiant heat and ambient heat, is infinitely more realistic than this Hobbit scene. I am citing Revenge of the Sith <laughs> as 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 having the high hand in terms of thermodynamic realism. People, either I need more bourbon or less bourbon. Or someone needs to fucking pay attention to the show. Anyhow, yes, this Scott's, is my... Scott's ears for the for the listeners at home have turned an interesting shade of pink. Yes. Uh, now, <laughs> everything I have to say after this point is basically I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, well, flailing around. What like is a, this? I don't even like a Futurama. Yes. Very much. What is this, listener? I don't even. Let's just say it's a dumb, dumb scene and leave it at that. But really, no dumber than the 400, 500 foot plunges that these incredibly elastic CGI stunt dummies have been taking for six fucking hours at this point. So, so I, have a, I have a complicated response to, to the, the bit right before the, well, what should be the climax of this movie, if, if it had a climax, um, wherein Smaug, the, the dwarves build a bizarre Rube Goldbergian trap using bits of abandoned dwarf technology and decoy Smaug into basically a flood of molten gold in which he is supposed to, I assume, drown or burn. Now this is where Peter Jackson succumbs to what I fondly refer to as Christopher Nolan disease, which is where you have 45 minutes of nonsensical setup for a really cool visual image. Because dragon dip, dipped in gold, flinging golden droplets everywhere as he flails about, Admi is a really cool visual image. Admittedly, totally awesome. It looked beautiful, but it's so stupid. It, it did not take 45 fucking minutes to get there. No, and, and while I appreciate the fact that the narrative knows that a dragon is probably not going to be injured by molten gold melted by his own dragon fire, albeit indirectly, but 
The fact that the dwarves can't figure this out kind of bothers me. But let's face it, the last time this particular group of dwarves were allowed by Peter Jackson and his anti-dwarf propaganda to be competent was when they were doing the, you know, chip the plates bit in the at the very beginning of the last movie. That is the last time. They, they can do an OK Go video, but apparently they cannot <laughs> fight a war. Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting really egregious at this point because we've now spent six hours that feel like 68 with these characters. The Hobbit is the story of these 13 dwarves and Bilbo Baggins, okay? They're the fucking stars. Now, admittedly, like, I think Beaufort gets one line in the book, but... Yeah, it, it's not <laughs> as though all of these characters were richly realized in their original literary incarnations. <laughs> Half of them really are just names and, and, and ticks, you know, no problem. But you don't have to emulate that. You've got a great cast. Um, you know, you, 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 you get Peter Jackson as a director who can do great things, who has done great things. It's just that the self-discipline is... It's elf privilege. The self-discipline is completely missing. You, it, it, this is all the, the, the bad Peter Jackson. Um, this is, you know, you, you have Gandalf in a strong supporting role, but, but the dwarves, this is their set of three movies to shine. What about this, Bilbo? Bilbo. I already Bilbo. mentioned him. <laughs> this, this is the movie for the short folks. And I'm just here to earworm our listeners. Evidently. In the most cruel you, fashion possible. She has been wanting to somehow work the bell to Bilbo Baggins <laughs> into this podcast all fucking night, I guarantee. Um, so, you, you, what do you do in, in the second film? Um, do you spend time with us, uh, you know, refocusing on the dwarves, their personalities, what differentiates them, what makes them interesting? Hell no. If you're Peter Jackson, what you do is you take the elf cameo that was very cool as a cameo. It was nice to see Legolas as a prince of the woodland realm. That... It was keen to see him and give him, you know, 20 minutes in the movie. Cool. I awesome. Been, I would have been totally cool with that. Uh, you know, because there are there, there is certainly a, a valid reason to have Legolas in this movie if you are expanding mm-hmm. from what's in the book. He's there. Yeah, you're you're He's providing just context. not a named character. You're, in the you're book. tying this all to the Lord of the Rings. You're, you're showing you know the the relationships between these realms in in Tolkien's work, and you know you're you're providing Legolas with something of a character arc. You're showing how he became a little more cosmopolitan. You know, in in uh, the Lord of the Rings, how this set him up for it. This is all cool. I'm I'm done with this. But then the film turns him and Toriel into the action centerpiece of the last quarter of the movie. I'm very sorry. That's my someone uh, phone. didn't turn her cell phone off. That's that's my phone telling me to to use my inhaler, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I will do after we finish the podcast. I, I, and I'm 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 dead serious. This you know Legolas uh, fights. Oh, it, the, we 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 part company with Tolkienic reality um, entirely in the last third of this film. I mean, there's 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 a lake town, there's a lonely mountain, there's a dragon, there's some dwarves, but basically the, the very simple and straightforward plot of The Hobbit has totally been shredded at this point. And it ceases to be an adventure that the dwarves are upon because the dwarves are completely indwarfulated. I, I don't know how else to describe it. They're... It, it's ama- it's their a- beards are clipped, man. Yes, they, yeah, their their beards are clipped. Um, they they are. It's it's a major plot point that they are captured by the elves of the woodland realm. Yes, we know this happens. Um, once they escape from the elves of the woodland realm, they basically become useless. Um, they they traipse around for nearly the rest of the movie um, in their night shirts without weapons. They're quitter dwarves. Yeah, s- s- seeking arms and armaments and 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 being useless. They. Find help in Lake Town. Um, who really the people of Lake Town are like one of the crowds in Springfield being harangued by Mayor Joe Quimby in The Simpsons. Um, you know, there's there's an episode of The Simpsons where he literally tells the crowd, you know, you people are fickle mushheads, and they cheer him. Oh, that's yeah. Lake Town. Welcome to Lake Town, everybody. I, I was I was viewing that because I'm an enormous nerd. As this is a a Champions game, and here are people making conflicting <laughs> presence attacks. This is like stacked presence attacks. Yes, people are making charisma checks, but nobody knows what they're about. They're just yes. they're just succeeding. I'm going to make a charisma check, and nobody's going to like you anymore. And now you're going to make a charisma check, and everybody's going to hate me. And, yeah. And we'll do this for five 
really boring minutes. Yes. So so get this. These dwarves are on a quest for which they have they, they've sacrificed months of their lives. They've sacrificed their fortunes. They've risked their lives. They've crossed the world and back. And it all hinges upon their being able to find the secret back door um, into so the speak. Lonely Mountain, so to speak. <laughs> Fanfickers, start your <laughs> engines. There's a lot of finding of the secret doors. Um, no, so they, they all end up um, on a dramatically appropriate cliff seeking the art. What are you pointing at? Oh, I'm just saying that we should probably wrap this up because we're going on half an hour now. Yeah. Okay. There are prisoners. We don't have to be nice to Ooh, them. Oh, okay. You are our prisoners, listeners. Just remember who was kind to you. <laughs> Just remember who tried to stop the train wreck. <laughs> um, they, they attempt to locate the secret door um, following the clues on the secret map. Um, you know, everyone pulls out their secret decoder rings. And the, the, what they're supposed to be looking for is the last light of Durin's day. Um, which, as any five-year-old could probably tell you, once you've exhausted the sun, you've also got the moon and the stars to work with, so you could, you know, fucking stick around and wait for the magic door to appear. The sun goes down, the magic door doesn't appear, and I swear to God, all the dwarves turn into an emo band music video, and they all slouch and walk <laughs> well, away they, while the... while the They can't sw- be OK Go anymore because they've lost all their competence. No, OK Go is fun. Um... <laughs> They, they all hang their heads, and, and, and the emotional music plays, and Bilbo is the only one who's like, Dumbasses! Dumbasses! Wait five minutes! Bilbo. So, the, the dwarves all go walking away along the mountain path, their hopes and dreams crushed, and it's like, you know what? You pack of fucking quitter dwarves do not deserve to get into the Lonely Mountain. You don't deserve to reclaim anything. You've been at this for how many years now, and you can't wait five fucking minutes, you bunch of pansies. You absolute wilting daisy dwarfs. Yeah, and and I, I, I'm yelling at fictional characters. What I'm really yelling at is the creators of the film. Because this sort of absolute rank defeatism is not an endearing character trait. It makes us wonder why we give a damn about these guys. No, I, I, I just want to ask you to reconsider your use of the word pansies there, which I think was reflexive. But. Oh, well, I, 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 I've always considered pansy to be less offensive than... Well, it's, it's, it's often used as a homosexual slur. I did not mean it to be that. That's, I didn't think you knew that, so... I'm from Minnesota, what do I know? <laughs> no, it, it certainly wasn't. I, I, was, I was attempting to find a, a floral metaphor for something that is weak and comes apart easily. So, pansies, daffodils. daisies, daffodils, whatever you want... The dwarves are written weak. It's not. It's 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 not intrinsic to their character. It's it's it, for some strange reason. It's what the people in charge of these films want them to be. But as I said, this isn't endearing. This isn't courageous. This isn't worth following for six hours. These guys are a bunch of losers. Nine hours. And Nine. Thorin. Well, we're not done yet. You no, know, true. We're not done yet because like tune like in sheep, next year. Like lemmings, we will because we're nerds. We will see the third one because we're stupid. Um, take your pick. This is, this is Scott and my idea of a date night. <laughs> um, only because I love you. Next time we're getting Indian food. I, and, <laughs> yes, yes and, we are. And I'm bringing my, and I'm bringing my and flask into liquor. the theater. You're driving because I'm bringing my flask into the theater. This is a good plan. I support this plan entirely. Okay. And <laughs> it, it, it's just indicative. We did this sober, boys and girls. It's, it's indicative of, of what has been done to the actual cast and characters um, who should be the stars of the Hobbit films. They're not allowed to be the stars in their own damn movie. The dwarves are just a footnote. that is, the, and, and they're all kept I, either unlovable or useless by the script that has been written for the film. Yes. Thor and Oakenshield... Um, has gone from being a a hot Klingon cipher to being an actively hot Klingon frustrating... cipher is the name of my next wireless <laughs> network. He's, he's he's an actively frustrating <laughs> douchebag. As as I've said, you know, when 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 they turned away and walked back down the path while the music swelled, I really didn't give a damn also, whether these guys ever he, got home or not. When he ditched Kiri, I mean that's Keely. Yes. Sorry, Keely. Curious, yes. curious, a song by Mr. Mister. I'm dating myself. Uh, <laughs> yes, when, when 
Keeley is injured and so might be a little bit slower than usual. And and so Thor and Oakenshield has this big spiel where it's like, no lad, you will only slow us down, therefore... Not that Thorin is even planning on going into the fucking mountain, it turns out, because yeah. he just wants Bilbo to go in and steal yeah. the Arkenstone for him. Not like these dwarves have, not... been, have been making Olympic record time over land. Not like they've really always been terribly effective or efficient. Also, also I, I, I will give Peter Jackson... I, I'm not sure if I'm giving him props for this, but for for those of you who are worried, he saved the ponies. Because the, 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 the ponies show up, and, and you know, those of you who've read the book know that the ponies eventually meet a grave and unkind fate at the hands of a certain dragon who we all know and admire. And in the movie, the ponies are played by an absolutely gorgeous herd of gypsy vanners, um, which are one of my favorite breeds of horse uh, there's there's actually a, a plastic gypsy vanner overlooking you on the on the bookshelf up there there is behind the behind the black mare there's a spotty horse next to cthulhu yes next to cthulhu and behind a, a stuffed dragon um <laughs> welcome to my bookshelf and so i leaned over to scott and i said don't get too attached to the gypsy vanners but it turned out the movie yes, saved them yes, that they were spared did not actually well they they've been spared so far there may be a gratuitous pony eating scene there may be there may be. Smaug may go flying off just looking for those ponies because Peter Jackson tried to save them. I, I, just, I, I just don't know. I just <laughs> for those of you who are worried say. about the fate of the ponies, because John Tolkien, not kind to ponies overall. Nope. They Ma- are, so many ponies died. So, they are, they so are many just ponies. fleshy motorcycles to park and uh, and then forget about. And, and no, and be eaten for pathos. And be eaten because yes. Bill gets eaten too, as I recall. Or does he run away? Um, I, I will. I, I I don't know. Um, I honestly don't know the fate of Bill the Pony. Um, in, it's, in, it's in the, a, books. It, the Watcher in the Deep is is the last time we see him, and I cannot remember if he gets eaten or if he runs away. It, I am failing geek. He is Schrodinger's pony. He is. It's a really good yeah. question. Um, but yeah, it, I... Poor pony. I, I'm very invested in the ponies, can you tell? It's not like we want... I, I mean, you know, the, the, the older I've gotten, the, the I, I like to think I've, I've gotten less tolerant of rank cynicism and, and, and stupidity. I, it's, it's not as though we, we, we wanted this movie to suck. We, we wanted this to be a good movie. We wanted it to be, um, you know, a, a, a redemption of the promise that was shown in the first film. Um, this was our this was our big we haven't seen each other in two months because we have, Scott and I have a commuter relationship. Yes. This was our big date night. Yes, and you know it's, <laughs> it's not like Peter Jackson knew that and deliberately designed the movie to ruin it. It's just that it it frustrates. He came both to of our us. house. We, since since we are you know in, in our professional lives we are essentially narrative architects, and we spend an awful lot of time thinking about the sense and sensibility of why our characters do this and why our characters do that. And this film is like a masterclass in how to convolute a narrative to no purpose. In in how not to. I mean, there's. I was I was willing to give him so much latitude in the first film because there are, there are things that he's doing there, in order to tie it into the Lord of the Rings and also in order to to give it more of an epic feel that I'm, mm-hmm. I'm willing to let him have. I'm willing to let him show me Gandalf's part of the story. Um, I, uh, you know, because that's... Gandalf is off having these epic adventures. Stuff is happening. And it's not on screen because the entire book is told from Bilbo's point of view and Bilbo usually gets knocked on the head mm-hmm. as soon as something interesting happens. Which... I'm willing to let Peter Jackson correct that. I'm willing to let him have Bilbo be a little more heroic. I am willing to let him have us see Gandalf go off and do cool Gandalf things because, hey, that's a little more Gandalf. (laughs) And that's not bad. But, but, But there's a difference between constructing a stronger narrative, i.e. having Arwen show up at the river and rescue the hobbits so that we know who she is and Mm -hmm. that she's heroic, and when she shows up later, we already have an attachment to her other than her being disposable love interest girl. Mm -hmm. And then there's wankery. I'm I'm sorry, Peter. 
wankery. Well, yeah, this is this is is not Legolas's story, and you know, as much as I welcome her addition to the action, this is not Toriel's story. Um, both of I'm, them. I'm are, all for more chick characters. Yeah, let me I, tell you. I, 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 you know, Toriel, i.e., the Wood Elf Smurfette, in that she's really the only the only female elf that we see. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm all for having her here simply for no. You know, even if the the only reason is to have more female presence on screen, it's a good thing in and of itself. I am totally okay with that because nine year old girls are going to go to this movie and wonder where they are. Yes. I want to be Toriel. Toriel kicks ass. Toriel I, kicks a lot of ass. I also appreciated the fact that there were a lot of people of color in Laketon. I would have... Mm-hmm. I, if you're going to do that, why not have some black dwarves? Heresy! I don't know. You know the, the, I, I, I don't, I'm just I don't saying. Think, I don't think Jackson... Thought that far ahead? Nope. I, you know, it's it's... Well, now, now, now we're assessing step, somebody else's motives. No, yeah, That's yeah, dangerous yeah. character. Two but steps forward, seven steps back. If, if you're, if you're going to have a multiracial lake town, why not have multiracial dwarves? There's no it's, reason. It's not cool, to. but why not go the go the extra step? Make make your make one of you know make one of your heroes a person of color. But re- returning to Toriel for, for just a moment. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> Toriel is, is a character apparently created out of whole cloth. I don't know if there were references to her in some other, you know, a- appendix or appendix. I have appendix. this vague memory that she's somewhere from the, she's she's from somewhere in the Silmarillion, but I may be okay, making that mentioned up. By name, but I, I read about I'm gonna out myself as a bad Tolkien geek. I read about thirty percent of the Silmarillion and I only did it once. That's, and I was in college at the time. That's A okay. <laughs> um Toriel is still terra incognita as far as these characters go. Anything can basically happen to her. She's, all she's all not the chick elves were in the Silmarillion. Yeah, she's, she's not featured at all in the Lord of the Rings films from ten years ago. Um, but Legolas is. And this is, just one, this is just one of those narrative structure things. Um, if you have the dwarves in an action sequence, um, you know that not all of them are going to make it out of this trilogy. So they are in danger. They are threatened. If you have a character like Toriel in an action sequence... You know that anything can happen to her. She's in danger. She is threatened. So what do they do? They make a gigantic action sequence with Legolas, the keystone of the last part of this movie, which makes no fucking narrative sense. Because Legolas, as you know, most of us know, spoilers, is alive and well in the time of Lord of the Rings. So we know that no matter... And makes it all the way through the Lord of the Rings. We know that no matter what happens to him in The Hobbit Part 2 or The Hobbit Part 3, he's going to be alive and kicking. He and and Bilbo are the characters we know don't die. Yes, he is... And Gandalf. Sorry, and Gandalf. And Gandalf. Um, And Galadriel, but she's not in this movie other than as a flashback. Yes, um, so... Legolas is the most boring character you can put into an action climax because he is effectively invincible and immortal. Nothing can possibly happen to him. To, so to to pin the action climax of the movie on him smacks to me of amateur hour. It also, is not interesting. Also as an occasional archer, and, and I, I just like to... Okay. Generally speaking, I try not to bitch about archery in movies because it's almost universally bad. I will give the Hunger Games movies this. Their archery is better than most of Hollywood's archery. But really, I mean, the Peter Jackson elf archery, even if they are elves, bows don't work that way. Bows, bows really, they, they don't. You can't, you can't gangsta fire a bow, guys. I, I got to complain about thermodynamics from a firefighter's perspective. She, <laughs> she, gets, she gets this one. <laughs> Bows don't work that way. No, they. It, as cool as it looks, they really, really don't. And I. And firing a bow at half draw doesn't really get you anything <laughs> except an arrow that bounces out of your target. Okay, done now. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the thing that amazes me is is really it's 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 really really astonishing. I, I think that elves, <coughs> Tolkien elves, at least as cinematically presented, are eighty percent arrows by body weight. <laughs> <laughs> because wherever they're pulling these damn things from, they're, 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 their quivers are not emptying. Okay, they're Hawkeye all... runs out of arrows. Yes, Hawkeye runs out of arrows. Ollie and... runs out of arrows. Yeah, Green Arrow occasionally goes, oh shit, I've got no arrows. And these, el- I mean, these elves shoot more arrows than God's own porcupine. And <laughs> they are never dry. They're, 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 so they're, they look like action figures. They're, 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 there are so many arrows in their quivers, so to speak. 
These these elves are the original quiver full movement. All I'm all I'm saying is is, is that this is one of those side effects. You went there. I did go there. <laughs> um, this is one of those side effects of CGI and 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 3D and and just the whole brain assault thing. Because look, I, I am absolutely not. Um, a priss about action scenes. I like action scenes. I like stabby, jumpy, shooty action scenes. I like bows. I like arrows. I like swords. I like cloaks. I like armor. I like. God likes to feed people to sharks. That's true. Every I like to feed people to sharks. But the thing about these films, and, and you know, permit me to get uber geek for a second. I know if you're still listening at this point, you you know what to expect. You've been here for forty five minutes. You've been warned, people. The uh, okay, the, the Lord of the Rings films um, are, are chock full of huge ass set pieces uh, with lots of people running around, throwing things at each other and stabbing each other, and, and so on and so forth. And they have a certain tactile uh, realism to them. They have a certain look and feel. They are grounded in visual reality because, for the most part, other than the most epic battle sequences, they tend to be groups of actual people in actual costumes running around. On actual dirt in actual forests, right for ruin in the world's end. Baby. Yes, you know the 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 gigantic orc battle at the end of Fellowship of the Ring is actual actors fighting actual actors in orc costumes. You know, jumping around on actual turf. It gives everything. You know, as I said, buying back the sense of disbelief. You know, convincing readers to buy the crazy shit because you are making everything else seem relatively Although, realistic. Most of the writers of Rohan were actually women. Yes. So, apparently when you send out a casting call for, please bring your horse mm-hmm. and come come ride really yeah. well, what you well, get that, that's what Shockingly it, enough. It's amazing what you can do with helmets and fake beards. Um, <laughs> Said Eowyn. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, I am no man. <clears throat> and um, I recently found out that that was apparently Tolkien being pissed off at Macbeth for losing. Yeah, him. Macduff was yeah. from his mother's womb. Untimely losing, ripped. losing the plot. Yeah, yes. that, ah, you fell I for can it. do that better. You fell for yeah. it. Um, his wife should have stabbed him in the balls. So, oh, was that my outside voice? Oh, Bourbon. <laughs> Hi, Bourbon. <laughs> I don't even know what we were talking about in reference to his wife should have stabbed him in the balls. But hey, what Macbeth. the hell? Okay, I. I, I I didn't know if you... It, a, Macbeth. B, Peter Jackson. C, Tolkien. We're B, not in a theater, Sora. so I can say Macbeth. Okay. Um, Although apparently my house used to be a doctor's office. The Scottish play, ladies and gentlemen. Um, anyhow, sorry. Tangent. We, 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 a tangent came... Came out the of room. the bourbon yes. bottle. <laughs> um, okay, so in, in these films, the thing is that the, the orcs are... Let's wrap very, this up by 60 minutes. The, the orcs are very, very obviously... Oh, that's being conservative. We've got all night. Um, <laughs> yeah, 60 minutes sounds good. Let's take mercy on the poor folks at home. Um, the, the orcs in the I've, Hobbit... I've still got Hild to read. Oh, well, I'm, I'm actually reading Peter Higgins' Wolfhound Century, yeah, which I'm, is really I'm, awesome. I'm, Let's plug fun I'm like five, for a moment. I'm like five chapters into Nicola Griffith's Hild, which is really, really Ooh, good. yes, I Although I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite as incredibly incandescently in love with it as the entire internet, but it's really awfully good. I forgot Nicola Griffith wrote that, so it goes <sighs> on my to-read pile when you're finished. Um, okay, so yeah, The Hobbit. The Hobbit, Little Hobbit film you were talking about. Um, okay, so CGI has completely supplanted that actual physical presence in these films. And it makes for a very animated cartoon, bouncy, jouncy artificiality that is yes. incredibly distracting. It's it's like that it's like that horrible Ben Affleck Daredevil movie CGI, <laughs> weightless CGI issue. Yes. Yes, it, 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 all the characters have this sort of weightlessness, this this you know this rubbery. Um, I should probably put this bourbon somewhere. Wow, we really away. have drank a we, lot of bourbon. We have drunk half a bottle of bourbon for your benefit, dear <laughs> listener, for your and for world builders. We're drinking for bourbon builders. for good drinking against evil. Bourbon for charity. Wait, wait, wait! Do that closer to the to the microphone. They need to hear the glug, glug, glug. That's onomatopoeia. <laughs> And if you can say onomatopoeia so, with a straight face, you haven't been drinking enough. So, Scott, how does a Wookiee drinking bourbon sound? <laughs> that was a cute noise. That's why I keep you around, because you're so <laughs> delicate and elfin. I think you mean dwarvish. 
All right. Uh, bourbon. Even if I can't. It, it is it is one degree, not counting wind chill outside here, by the way. So we we need this bourbon. Yeah, it is nutsack blisteringly cold outside. It is absolutely... Wow, I'm you're, stealing that kind of phrase. Now, the, ladies and gentlemen, that is how he writes the Gentleman <laughs> Bastard books. He talks like that in real life. Yes. Welcome to Brookfield, Massachusetts. Tom, model your tauntunnel freedom before you reach the first <laughs> marker, and we'll see you in hell. No, that's that's Grand Marais, Minnesota. Oh, okay, yeah. Minnesota is worse at the moment. We are we are in the midst of of winter's frosty grip, and uh, there's nothing to. I mean, we're like the farmers of old here. There was nothing to do in the old New England winters except sit inside and record podcasts. Mm. Scott is Scott is contemplating moving to New England for the balmy tropical winters. It was nice when I got here, but then this shit fell out of the sky, and I'm suddenly reconsidering. <laughs> um, okay, so we were talking about men in foam latex costumes pretending to be orcs. Um, yeah, there, there's just, I mean, everything in these damn films. First off, I really think that the... Uh, okay. We saw Gravity this year, and Gravity was awesome. Gravity, for all of its scientific errors that were egregious... For, yes, for, it for, was... for all of... I, I mean, I, the thing that I love about Gravity, other than the movie, is the fact that the internet was full of scientists saying, this is bullshit, and it's gorgeous. Yes. It was an amazing use of 3D technology and visual effects. It was the most harrowing film I had that ever seen. That is what seen. 3D is for. We were holding each other's hands with white-knuckled fervor. We were clinging to our seats. It was like an and IMAX film. And that was just film. the trailer. Yes, it was like an IMAX film times 10. This technology can be used for good on rare occasion. And in the Hobbit films, it is not. The, it, it's it's just, used to toss arc heads at you. Yes, you, you you can see where oh Peter Jackson the structure of the fucking films has been fundamentally distorted because here's a point where we have to throw something at the camera. Um, you oh, look an arc head. You have never seen so many dwarves dangling from things. That should be the real <laughs> subtitle of the Hobbit movies: dwarves dangling from for shit. This. They I, dangle from chains. They dangle from pulleys. They dangle from buckets. This is 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 like from barrels. Yeah, in from mid-air. barrels. This is, is, is really like... Barrels the, do not work that way. Indiana Jones and the Dwarven Temple of Doom. They they hang from things, they soar, they flop, they fall, they bounce. They are either zooming away from us or toward us or to the side. I mean, they, they, they it's it just gets ridiculous. I am not going to let you talk me into going back to see this in 3D to see how bad the 3D no, is. No, we saw it in 2D. And the thing about... We, we generally insist upon that. Um, the, the last movie we saw in 3D, because we really had no choice, was Thor of the Dark World, where at, at least the 3D portions were largely unobtrusive. It was it was inoffensive, and also we saw it in the UK, where they give you these wonderful little things that clip onto your actual glasses. Mm, that was so kind of nice. So, if you're a four-eyed freak like both Scott and I, you don't have to wear uncomfortable, bulky, awkward... Yeah, you, you don't have to do Lance Armstrong cosplay just to watch the movie. <laughs> Um, I, I actually brought my little clip-on UK 3D glasses home, and I will take them with me to any future 3D movies. Scofflaw. They are, they, they, we paid for them. Yeah, Jesus true. Christ, that movie was expensive. True, true. True on all counts. I wish I knew where the hell mine were. I think you left um, them in London. My girlfriend, ladies and gentlemen, smarter than I am. But hey, somewhere in London, there are free 3D glass clip-ons <laughs> for anybody who wants them. Anyhow. In the, the My Hotel Bloomsbury Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Even though there were times in the, the, the original Lord of the Rings films where the action would become incoherent because you'd get that, you know, up-the-nose, shaky cam thing that started to really become trendy in the wake Surf of Saving Private else. Ryan. Yes. Um, the film was still composed um, without the specter of 3D looming over it. And these films are absolutely 3D's slaves. Masturbatory. It's it, it 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 drives the the composition of all of the action sequences to their detriment. I think, and you can really see it when you watch something in in two D and spot the bits where it's like ah that is an obvious three D effect. Um, there were amazing action sequences in the Fellowship of the Ring that were absolutely. Um, enveloping, absolutely involving. I'm thinking of the collapsing staircases in Moria. The whole sequence was awesome, and there wasn't a speck that was, of... That was breathtaking. Yeah, absolutely. You can create this immersive experience that doesn't actually poke the viewership in the eye, and that's Unlike the thing about... the goblin yes. sleigh ride. Yes, the, the ridiculous bouncy-wouncy CGI. Yes, wibbly-wobbly, bouncy-wouncy CGI monsters all over the place. And I'm not... 
harshing on CGI for CGI's sake, for God's sake. I'm only 35. Well, I think that I think it's significant that the best sequence in the first Hobbit movie, um, I don't remember the subtitle. Oh, the Riddles in the Dark sequence? Yeah, is is the one that was directed by Andy Serkis. Yeah, second unit director Andy Serkis. Um, um, the, the Riddles in the Dark sequence. Which is like from a whole different goddamn movie. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's atmospheric, it's gorgeous, it's tense, it's creepy. It, it's it's a strong adaptation that is that is absolutely faithful to the book and yet creates its own sense of atmosphere that is spellbinding. And it's Ooh, it's it's good word, Mr. Spellbinding. Lynch. You yes. should be a writer. A fantasy reference. <laughs> spellbinding. spellbinding. About Lord of the Rings films. Um, All right, do the Gollum voice. <laughs> no, Please? I can't just do it on command for the love of God. No. <laughs> no. You can't. You can't. See now, now I no, now I'm self conscious no, about it. because because this would be the appropriate venue for the Gollum voice. No, now I'm all self conscious about oh, okay. it. I will fuck it up. Well, fine. I'm going to drink bourbon. I'm going to drink bourbon, too. Okay. Bourbon, if you've got bourbon, drink it. If you don't have bourbon at this point, what the hell Go is... Go out and buy what some What is wrong with movie? you? You've been listening to this whole podcast unmedicated. Are you stupid? Fix ladies, that. Ladies, gentlemen, and those who declaim a non-gender identified... Or, or non-binary gender identification. Um, let me just say, on your behalf... I'm going to have such a hangover in the morning. I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> yes, this, this, is our, this is our delayed. I hope you Hobbit appreciate the two. suffering I am going to partake of tomorrow. Ah, but that's see, we're we're not anti CGI. CGI allows you to do amazing things and create beautiful vistas. I mean, many, many, many portions of the Lord of the Rings films uh, feature absolutely gorgeous and sweeping um, CGI creations. Um, it can be used to enhance atmosphere. It can be used to deepen the world, to deepen the visual effect. Um, it can be used to eradicate traces of the modern world. Um, there's yes. so much good that can be done with it. But when it's used to... Ooh, it's negative eight. It's it's minus eight degrees outside. But it's always warm in podcast land. The dog just climbed up onto the couch with, with us. Yes. Uh, Ace, the 90-pound Briard, has joined us. And uh, he is contributing Giant warmth. and hairy. Yes. Our, we have a Wookiee in our house, and you can't see it when we're petting him. Um, he didn't, Your Wookiee is better than he mine. Didn't he like didn't like this. He it. didn't like this movie much either. Um, so no, there, there's there's just this this general overkill with all of these wonderful toys that can be used to make uh, great art in the Neil Gaiman sense. These movies could have been fucking brilliant. Peter Jackson has it in him to do Hell, great things. Hell, they could have not sucked. They could have oh, simply, outside voice. They could have simply been adequate, but this, the, the sad thing is, is that the Hobbit Part Two makes the Hobbit, the Hobbit Part Two makes the Hobbit Part One look like House Party Two. Sylvester or three. No, Sylvester it, it, McCoy is embarrassed to be in this movie. Actually, Radagast's part in the second movie is actually not bad. Yeah, that's why I said he's embarrassed because, like, his bit is good. It, yeah, they they they've kind of removed the over the top comedy of Radagast, and Radagast you know, actually gets a slightly dark and serious side. And I and I was totally there for Radagast and his racing bunnies. Yeah, be, because there's, there's, other, less, there's less crap on his head in this movie. Yeah, other other geek revelations, dear listeners. Sylvester McCoy is my doctor, the seventh doctor. Every, every Doctor Who fan has a doctor that is their doctor, and Sylvester McCoy is mine. He's very special to me. I'm fucking delighted that international audiences are getting at least one more chance to see him in something that is going to do huge ass box office. I, I'm I'm so pleased. And as others have pointed out, you know this is. Um, Gandalf and Radagast is also King Lear and his fool from uh, the BBC adaptation of, of King Lear that came out about four or five years ago. One, one of these years you have to sit me down and subject me to the Seventh Doctor because I've mostly missed him. I will. We will just kind of skip time in the Ronnie and everything else has a lot to recommend it. Mm. Um, <laughs> that was the sound of Michael and Lynn Thomas uh, warming up the uh, Thomas Mobile to come teach us. Um, <laughs> no, I, I I love Sylvester McCoy and See, my, Rad, Radagast was the very obvious comic relief of the first film in the I'm, way that I'm boring, Gimli. I'm boring, and my doctor is four. Oh God, don't get me started on there's, Gimli. There's, We're not going to talk about Gimli. There's nothing boring about four. Have no fear. 
Um, no, but, but but he's like the stereotypical doctor. Well, yes, the definitive portrayal of a character <laughs> does tend okay, to be labeled a stereotype. But 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 mostly, um, it's the fact that I was, you know, in oh grammar school and at my grandparents' house and I happened to be, you know, staying with them for the weekend and I turned on the TV and I put on PBS because that was what you did. This mm-hmm. There was no cable then because I am old. <laughs> and there was this thing with the Loch Ness Monster, which I was obsessed ah, with. yes. And a fuzzy-haired guy who yelled a lot and had a scarf and... So so basically I fell face first into terror, a, a Terror of the Zygons marathon and it was it was it was love at first chase scene. It was ridiculous. <laughs> um, and the reason I love Chris Eccleston is because I feel like he understands Tom Baker. Mm. That's a very good description of it. Um, anyway, the oh wild, wow, we're nerdy. The wild eyed space nutter who has nerdy. the power to go totally serious yes. at, at the turn of a you know. Yes, we're nerdy and drunk. We are nerdy, and one of us is drunk. (laughs) I, of course, only get more suave as I get tipsy, dear listeners. And trustworthy. I get more trustworthy as I get tipsy. Have you noticed how he's getting closer and closer to the microphone as the evening progresses? Close to the microphone (laughs) equals trustworthiness. And we are over an hour, but we don't care, because we are (laughs) depraved and indifferent and tipsy. Um, and now we're talking about Doctor Who. Yeah, now we're talking about Doctor Who. So, no, I, Radagast doesn't get much to do in this film except caution Gandalf not to get his ass caught in a trap, which, of course, Gandalf does. Um, you know, you, you, but at you, least Radagast gets to be a sensible one. It's, 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 I'm, I'm slurring, aren't I? Well, well I'm, I'm starting to sound drunk. I, I, I enjoy it because the, the thing about the portrayal of these characters is, is that, you know, um, Gandalf has this secret aspect in that he's this angelic being sent to Middle Earth. To carry out the the orders of this of you know a higher authority. Are you authority. saying he's a valor? Um, yes. Um, really? Yes. Yes. I remembered the word valor. Yes, valor. Congratulations, <laughs> congratulations, Colbert. You're a talking nerd. Yay! Um, <laughs> you know, it's congratulations, drunk bear. Aww. Aww. Um, Radagast. Um, and this is the thing: is the the impression really given by the portrayal of Gandalf over the course of these movies? Um, you know, Gandalf the Grey is warm and human and welcoming and fun, and Gandalf the White is a striding douchebag on a crusade. Gandalf See, the White forgets Gan- everything that not, Gandalf the Grey was. Gandalf the White is not a douchebag. It, at least not by me, because I would describe very few of Tolkien's characters as douchebags. Okay, a douchebag may, may be a bit much, but Gandalf the White is a weapon. Yes. Gandalf the, yes. Gandalf Gandalf the White the, is all purpose. And I think you can Gandalf see... Gandalf the White is an angel. Yes. G- I mean, Gan- that's, Gandalf that's the Grey... Gandalf the Grey has become human, and he sheds that to become Gandalf the White. Yes. I think that's... It, it's and, and it's presented, at least in my reading, as a tragedy. That That is the tragedy of tragedy of Gandalf. Yes, and I think Ian McKellen portrays that yes. rather brilliantly. That, he you know, has Gandalf, to shed his humanity to become dangerous. Again. Ex- exactly. Gandalf the Grey does not fear death. He is just afraid of, of losing what he is, you know, the, the, the nature that he has worked up over the centuries that he has been Gandalf the Grey, Gandalf Stormcrow. Yeah. Gandalf the, the dude who likes a good cup of tea and a beer and a good joke and, and wandering in the wild. And Yes, he's, he's humane. Um, And he knows what will happen to him if he ever assumes Saruman's mantle as, you know, the leader of the Council of the Istari. If he he assumes his proper role in in facing down Sauron. Thus thus leading to my my favorite Tolkien quote, which is the, I am the most dangerous thing you will ever meet Mm -hmm. unless you were brought live before the throne of the Dark Lord himself. Yes. And and because Gandalf knows what he is, but he also knows what he's chosen not to be. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, Gan- and yeah, Gandalf that's... is in no hurry to get there. Is is yes. the major thing? And that is the that is for me the real tragedy of his encounter with the Balrog is that he has to sacrifice. He survives. Yeah, and a Gandalf survives. A, yes, but he has to sacrifice his delight, his connection, his 
pipe smoke and whackery, mm -hmm. his hobbitness. Yes, in, in order in order to save the, the civilization and the people he has actually come to enjoy yes. being amongst. And I think the portrayal of Radagast really Ooh. strengthens this impression because it, it gives the impression that these Istari sort of fall into the roles they build for themselves. You know, Gandalf the Grey likes to wander and delve into forgotten secrets and hang out with people and, and you know, just he's a very chill sort of wizard. Radagast hangs out with his little forest friends mm -hmm. and gets up to his... He you know, talks to bunnies. He talks to bunnies and smokes a lot of weed and, you know, gets on very well with the birds. And when Gandalf ventures into, in, in The Hobbit Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, when, when <laughs> no. Gandalf... No! There, there, there's, there's actually a very, very cool scene where Gandalf goes to investigate the mountaintop prison where the Nazgul were held and finds all of the... Um, that was a good scene. Yeah, very good scene, very atmospheric and ominous, and finds all of their prison cells burst outward and empty. And... Um, Radagast is the one... Gandalf wants to run back to the Hobbits and continue their adventure, and Radagast is the one who basically says, you fight a bigger fight, Gandalf. If you, you, know, if you value what they, go they're fighting the for, you and I have to go deal with the big boy. And, and you know, leave your friends to their possible doom because you have responsibilities. And Gandalf says, abandon my friends? Yes, and, and Radagast says, uh-huh, that's what we are and that's what but, we do. But then they get to... Um, sorry, I'm... I'm Dal Guldur. Yeah, Dal Guldur. And Gandalf fires Radagast. He's like, go, I'm dealing with this. Mm -hmm. It's very... It, it, there's an interesting layering there. But yeah, both both of the, the portrayals of the Istari, they, they go through this sort of awakening process where they're, they're both, you know, on screen, very reluctant to separate themselves from the concerns mm -hmm. that have driven them. And then as the plot develops and the, the you know, the obviousness of, of Sauron's involvement and everything becomes apparent, they, you know, they, they lose that innocence and they accept their, their mantle of responsibility. And it's, it's much, much more effective. I, I think it's much more affecting to make these guys, you know, somewhat tragic, to, to see that the, the, this mantle of humanity they put on can be cast aside. And I, I give the movie full props for that. And I think it, it, the one thing that it doesn't fuck up is that it does not undercut Ian McKellen's portrayal of Gandalf in the original Fellowship, uh, Lord of the Rings films. I, I don't know if you can physically do that because Ian McKellen has been good at his job in a lot of very bad movies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's... True let's, this... Ian McKellen doesn't suck. I, it's it's sort of like Patrick Stewart showing up at the end of Men in Tights and being not bad. Patrick Stewart in Masterminds. <laughs> it's it's like, oh my God, this movie, why am I watching this? Oh right, Carrie Always. But he's trying. He's really trying. He's, he's doing good. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. This, oh, Patrick Stewart, everything is better now. <laughs> and I, I think, which is because apparently... Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen are very good friends, and it seems only appropriate that these two guys who kick ass should both have that ability to elevate whatever it is that they're associated with. Mm -hmm. Because when Ian McKellen was on the screen, I did not hate this movie. And I should say that I went into this movie wanting not to hate it. I went into it wanting to love it. Good God, yes. We're, we're both congenitally programmed to love this movie. We are fantasy nerds. Nerds to the utmost. Gentle, you know. Reader, I, we married it, okay? We are total, absolute geek balls. Motherfucker, I paid for a copy of Faster Pussycats where there's a whip, there's a way. <laughs> I did The Walk to Mordor and I reread all three of the Lord of the Rings books, chapter by chapter, as I achieved them. I'm I'm really a big fan. Yeah, we, we I, are... I would like to I would like to corner China Mieville one of these days and have a really big fucking argument with him about the actual. Yeah, let's let's not get, of... let's not get into it with Mieville and Moorcock <laughs> and their very selective reading of the meaning of the Lord of the Rings because well, certainly because Jesus have... Christ, if these books are not about 
average guy is very important to the salvation of the universe, then I can't read. They have they have some valid points, but in the main, they are very tendentious and frustrating. And yes, this is an argument. And I for say this podcast. as a Paul Anderson fan. Yes. Oh wow, that was loud. Obscure. That's okay. Did we mention we have bourbon? Because we do. There is bourbon, bourbon on all board. Over the place. Bourbon, bourbon on bourbon, board. Bourbon in our bellies. <laughs> bourbon on board. B O B. Yes. Like most authors, you know, some people... Yes, again, this pro- this podcast brought to you, and they are not paying us, by, Knob- by Knob Creek Smoked Maple Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, which I note now, it is having drunk half a bottle... tipple of the evening. ...is 90 proof. Yes, it is, ladies and gentlemen. We're drunk. You know, some... We promised... Some- some we people have those little vinyl decals of how many kids and pets they have. We have vinyl decals of bottles on the backs of our cars. That's how you know. We are professional authors. Octors. Octors. In the octorial voice, which is to say, drunky McDrunk. No, no, no. That is actually a horrible, garish stereotype, we will, which we are perpetuating. Yes. Because we, we drink. Will, we will sing Iluvatar, Sent the Valar Across the Water. Well. To lead Morgoth to will. the slaughter, and that's good enough for me. <laughs> Help. <laughs> Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. <laughs> There'll be a brief He's pause. Pleasing me. There'll He's be a brief pause me. while I hug my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Your obscure Middle Earth trivia is endearing. Because <laughs> I'm I'm singing Middle Earth verses of that old time religion. <laughs> uh yes, it's a little more than I can do, I'm afraid. To leave Morgoth to is. the slaughter. You can sing. You uh, just don't, I, I'm just having got you drunk You're confusing yet. me with some other human being. See, all right. Now, we should probably wrap this up by one hour, 15 minutes. So that means yes. closing, closing statements. We, we promised to wrap this up by the 60-minute mark, but this time we really mean it. Honest. You can trust us. <laughs> and Knob Creek. Me. Knob Creek. We haven't drank all the Knob Creek. Anyway, so did we tell Bilbo you Baggins. about this movie we saw recently? It's called The Hobbit Part 2. It's bad. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think I, I wanna... Anchorman 2 might have been more uh, loyal to Tolkien's original text. I'm just guessing, though. I, I, I'm still trying to figure out how you can have a visual effects team good enough to produce that dragon and then fuck it up oh well, did i say fuck i i don't think they wrote the movie i mean they're they're, no, they're but, stuck conjuring whatever the director wants but jesus christ i mean it it's the effects are so good reader the effects are good i I would like to hire this effects team to produce every book I have ever written that has a dragon in it. And and, and I have I have I have a dragon thing. Like my dragon thing is probably deep down as embarrassing as Peter Jackson's elf thing. No. But I'm but I'm but I'm narrative self-control. Well, yes, I, I I try to be aware of the fact that I have a dragon thing that is really embarrassing and therefore when I choose to put a dragon in my work, I try to restrain myself. Instead of writing 400 pages of, oh my god, dragon, 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 let me rub up against this dragon like a Pekingese masturbating against your ankle. <laughs> well, yeah, it's... <laughs> you, you have this majestic, awe-inspiring creature. And, and, well, well, I'm going to finish. I'm going to let you finish, but Beyonce <laughs> was the best dragon of all... Okay. This Christmas season. This is how I feel about dragons. I am completely, I'm out of myself here. I am a complete dragon fetishist. I fucking love dragons. Dragons are the best things ever. I really thought the whole Smaug thing got boring. Back to you, Scott. I am a time traveler from the future. Just here to warn you, we don't actually make it to the minute 15 mark cutoff. You are warned. Oh, um, no, we do, we do, we do. <laughs> we're not going to... Wrap up quick. We're not going to... Wrap up, wrap gonna, up. You wrap expect up. me to wrap I'm up done, in wrap less up. than a minute? No, you're not done. You're I'm done. Wrap up. 
Um, no, it, it's 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 not a failure of visual effects. It's a failure of storytelling. You have this incredibly majestic, awe-inspiring creature, which you've got to remember ceases to be interesting when you don't have it doing awe-inspiring and wonderful things on screen. It's supposed to be a threat. It's supposed to be a menace. It is not supposed to sort of be there like Bob who works in the office cubicle across from you for 40 minutes doing nothing. Star Wars would not be anywhere near as much fun if Darth Vader burst into the Rebel spaceship and then we followed him for 40 fucking minutes while he went back to the Star Destroyer <laughs> and he filed some papers yes. and he talked about the navigation plans and maybe sent a report back Threat to the Emperor. Threatened some people ineffectually. Stopped off and made a little Darth poopy <laughs> in his little capsule, polished his helmet, you know. It, he would it, it would suck the menace and the interest out of the character completely. And unfortunately, that is what happens with Smaug who talks too long and is seen too long, and all of the coolness is drained out of him bit by bit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what two-thirds of a bottle of bourbon sounds like. Wow, we were at half the bottle last time. Yeah, well, something happened. Yes, the the level of bourbon has gone down. (laughs) Bad thoughts cause bourbon to (laughs) vanish. Bad thoughts cause dragons. dragon. Bad thoughts, Custer. Oh, I'm going to be so hungover tomorrow. Anyhow, no, it's okay. We there's there's aspirin and water for that. Oh and there's, God, there's make me to take vitamins. You. Yes, aspirin, water, and vitamins. Um, not like we've ever been drinking lots and lots, uh, loyal audience. Because at this point, nobody is left but the loyal audience, the <laughs> maniacs. The crazy people. The people who have already seen this movie and want to see what other yes. horrible things we, we're going we, to say about we've it. We've essentially told you everything that there is to say about the film, which is basically that Bourbon and Scott Lynch. It makes The Hobbit Part 1 look restrained, which is absolutely batshit crazy. But it really does. It It kind of makes the Peter Jackson Return of the King, which... You have to understand, if you have actually read the Tolkien Return of the King, is 200 pages of book and 200 pages of appendix. (laughs) Look restrained. You know, I got nothing. Oh, God. I was there. I'm beginning to wonder if we're going to get a Hobbit Part 3 that has, you know, four endings. Ah! <laughs> you know that that that, that actually I'm I'm, I'm going to bitch about the Return of the King for a moment. Go right ahead. Because I am I am actually a Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings apologist. I am a fan. You I and me liked both. it. I thought it really worked. Overall, there was some stuff I wasn't too keen on, like Kissy Horse and. You know, there were 17 ending beats, and none of them were the scouring of the Shire. But overall, it was good, and I liked it. And then there's this. And and then there's this, which is, you know, it's not like The Hobbit is unfilmable. As, as we've said, it would... <laughs> Fucking really, <laughs> fucking up the Hobbit is Break like fucking up a cup of soup. Plates, that's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Oh my God! This is this is a a Suddenly simple. They are phoning in to to copyright infringe me. Yeah, this 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 is a simple, straightforward action adventure tale that could have been richly told in the screen real estate provided. And it is, it is like a bunch of first-time movie makers have stolen every page from every trendy screenwriting guide. Gotta have this, gotta Except add more action not. beats, gotta have a character arc that does this, Scott? without really understanding what any of it means or serves. This is caused by too much money. I would like to have this problem. Well, see, here, here's the thing. Now, and here's why you have me around. Because oh, is this why? Yeah, because thank when God, they, when I'm they, finally what two and a half years. Yeah, when they offer you umpteen thousand dollars for the bigger, better, better gentleman bastards third edition, you'll say, "But I've seen The Hobbit." <laughs> um. Then I will say, "How much money?" 
<laughs> How many dump trucks do you propose to drive up to my lawn? <laughs> And then I, I, I will I will offer my advice, but but you know, I, I guess this is the thing is, is that look, these movies um, have, I, have I said gentlemen bastards enough? Oh yes, I wrote these books. Um, you might have heard of them. Um, these movies, the Hobbit movies, were guaranteed to be a license to fucking print money. I mean, we saw them. Uh, when did we? Was it the day after? It was the 28th or the 29th? The day after I flew here, so it was uh, December 30th. So the movie's been in release for, what, two weeks mm-hmm. at least? And it was still full. Yeah, the theater was full. Absolutely full. We um, were lucky to find seats together so we could nudge each other to stay awake. Yeah. People are crazy about this series. People are crazy about Tolkien. These movies come with their own pre-aware, absolutely hyped, ready-to-go audience. They are they are absolutely licenses to roll around. Well, we're in over a, 115. In a, I, I warned you. From I came from the future and told you. Um, I time traveled for your sake. Maria you didn't believe will be me. happy. <laughs> um, these movies are excuses for the producers to roll around in a Scrooge McDuck money bin. They can each everybody involved get some money bin. Sylvester McCoy gets some money bin. What do I have to do to get a money bin? Uh, write crappy movies, apparently. Shit. The thing is, these movies would have made the same billion fucking dollars if they had actually been... If they had not sucked. Excellent stories. And, see, this this is the, the, the Hollywood conundrum. This is where all of my screenwriter friends are like, yes, and your point is, because if Hollywood makes billions and billions of dollars putting out bullshit, why would they ever bother to not put out bullshit? It's well, a the, very, very, very self-answering sort of problem. The, the, the mistake that Hollywood makes is it, when it extrapolates trends, it does it stupidly. For example, it's like, well, action movies with women don't make money. Ignoring, except when they do, all over the goddamn place. Except when they do, all over the goddamn place. But but we have this preconception, so we are going to cherry pick the data that supports it. Um, fantasy movies, they don't make money. Science fiction movies definitely don't make money, except for the fact that eighteen of the top twenty grossing movies ever are either fantasy or science mm-hmm. fiction movies. Are you? Are solidly genre movies. Um. So. Basically, their metrics suck. And we need to stop talking. Yes, we will shortly stop talking. I, I guess the the final point, dear listener, for those of you that are still with us, is that, that as I said, there's, there's no fucking reason on earth that these movies should not be commercial and yet not um, be, be successful awesome. artistically. Um, they're they're going to be commercially successful as awful as they are. They could be commercially successful and awesome. And the thing is, I can't help but feel they would only be even more commercially successful if they did not actively hurt to think about it. <laughs> because I was not one viewer as far as Fellowship of the Ring was concerned. I was six. I paid to see it six fucking times. I enjoyed it that much. I... Want to be able? You know, I, I will not be going. Well, back to you know, the Hobbit. We're, we're old now, so we don't do it that often. Nonetheless, um, I've been old for longer than you have. When, when Star Wars Episode One came out, Aaron McGruder, <laughs> the guy who draws the Boondocks, um, had a lengthy rant on his website. And one of the things he said was, "What the hell is going on here? What, what is wrong? I should not feel like this. I should want to go see this movie another ten goddamn times this week alone." I felt that way about Fellowship of the Ring. I felt that way about The Two Towers. I haven't felt about anything since. And I am decidedly not feeling it I about was, the Hobbit movies. I was... I, I just realized this, and I feel like I should say it. I was one of those assholes who was in line at midnight on opening night to see all three of the Lord of the Rings movies. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally. Same I was, boat. I was... In the little channel, standing there, in a casino in Las Vegas, oh, which you is, poor thing. you know, that's where the movie theaters are. You out got there. better. I got better, but but if you live in Vegas, the movie theaters are in casinos, which means you can play the slots while you wait. <laughs> How about no? <laughs> 
Nickel slots? Ah, uh, no. Okay, anyway. Um, and I do not feel any of that urge with the Hobbit movies. And it's it's a goddamn shame. They've got a, they've got a great cast for the dwarves. They've they've got Ian McKellen, uh, you know, doing Gandalf as only he can. They've got Martin Freeman, who is an absolute treasure as Bilbo. Make no bones about it. I think Martin Freeman. Oh, he's brilliant. Is the very best Hobbit in all of these films. You know, absolutely. You know, no offense to the Hobbits of the Lord um. of the Rings. They're all. They're all fantastic. Hey, hey, my, I think my, Martin my, Freeman my is, nearly namesake is pretty goddamn good. They're they're all great, but Martin Freeman is the best of a great bunch. I was he I is, was almost named Peregrine. He is perfect. I was as born Bilbo in nineteen seventy one. He is superbly clever and vulnerable and lovable and humane. He's everything a hobbit should be and everything that Bilbo in particular should be. It's like he was born to play this role. I've been a huge appreciator of Martin Freeman ever since uh, The Office, um, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, and all the stuff that I've <laughs> seen he him in. That? Yes, he, he, uh, he's a doctor in Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Um, he is he's one small cameo, and he also has a cameo as a doctor in Black Books. I mean, he was one of those actors who was in... Like everything, everything in a cameo role back in the day. So he's Martin definitely Freeman done his time in, in the comedy trenches. Um, he's great, but he is magnificent as Bilbo. And like, like I said, we don't want to be having this conversation. We want to be rabid partisans of this film. We want to be aching God, to yes. see it again and again and again and again. And we're not. And we're not. And, you know, I, I don't know what else to say besides we are predisposed to love this film with every fiber of our being. And it lost us. It lost us hard. And that's not what we wanted, you know? I mean, that's, that's, that's not the coolness we sought, alas. Um, but uh, what you did get out of it, um, if you got anything out of it, was our semi-coherent, drunken hour-and-a-half podcast somewhat occasionally dissecting it when we weren't talking about Doctor Who and or other things. And and we are now down to, for the record, a third of a bottle of bourbon. That bottle has just been... At, wow. Yeah, she's not kidding. But I'm not the one who's been... It's in you, <laughs> and it's in me. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very maple-flavored at the moment, <laughs> apparently. We are, it's, in, we are it's, internally it's, basted with Knob Creek goodness. Knob Creek Smoked Maple Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Mm. 90 proof. Small batch. Patiently crafted. It won't help you forget The Hobbit. It will just help you care less. But it's delicious and it will give you a hangover, which I will be suffering tomorrow on your behalf. Oh my God, I, this is going to suck. I'm so sorry, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, thank you for bearing with us. Uh, thank you for uh, whatever generous donations you've given to World Build. If you have given generous donations, sorry, there was a little bit of a skip there because um, we had to fight some ninjas. Yeah, ninjas. <laughs> ninjas! Ninjas. Ninjas. The bane of every Hobbit movie dissection. Um, I'm... Mall ninjas. Mall ninjas. Like Worst Smaug. of all. Mall ninja dragon smoke. Um, I'm Scott Lynch. I'm Elizabeth Bear. And the shuffling noise in the background is our dog, Ace. Woo! We Ace. all wish you a very happy new year. Um, and uh, we wish you would go home and spend time with your families who wonder where you are. And probably you should wait to see The Hobbit Part 2, The Desolation of Subplots. Yeah, d DVD or streaming is your friend because you can pause yeah. it, you can go do things like drink heavily... Really, don't you don't, don't find have yourself, to smuggle the bourbon in. Yeah, you don't have to be trapped watching this movie. This is a movie to contemplate at your leisure, um, somewhere other well, than a movie well, theater. While reading a book or playing video games. Yeah, bring a book. Bring a book. <laughs> Possibly uh, The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> it's a good book. Yeah, it somewhat resembles this film. 